Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Golub. I'm the CEO of Docker. Um, Docker, if you're not familiar, is an open source project which launched uh, two weeks before the last OpenStack conference. Uh, we just passed our 150,000th uh, download, uh, 200th developer, so we're not quite growing at, uh, at uh, OpenStack speed, but we're, we're trying to. Um, before I get started, I just want to do a little bit of a familiarity check. Um, if you are familiar with Docker and containers, can you raise your right hand? And if you're a newbie, raise your left. All right. Um, and now a uh, DevOps versus uh, Dev split. Uh, if you're an ops type, raise your hand really high. Keep it still, reflecting your passionate belief in uptime and stability. And uh, if you're a developer, just sort of raise your hand anywhere you want and knock stuff over while you're doing it. OK, and finally, if you would uh, prefer this to be mainly focused on demo, please lean forward and act as if you're typing on using a CLI. And if you'd prefer this to be mainly a PowerPoint presentation, just do your best imitation of somebody who's severely jet lagged at a conference. Great. OK, so we will make this largely a, um, a uh, uh, an interactive session. I'm just going to go over really quickly uh, Docker, where it comes from, the need for containers. Um, and Docker in OpenStack. Uh, I'm then going to switch it over to uh, uh, our friend uh, Jason from Rackspace, who's going to talk a little bit about how Rackspace has been using Docker. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Nick, who is going to do a uh, Docker 101 session and then a live demo. In this demo, we will be building a container from source, uh, running it through test. We will then deploy it on the laptop, uh, then on, an, uh, on a public cloud. Uh, then on another public cloud, and then on an OpenStack cluster, and we're going to do this all live. So when we get to that portion of the demo, if I can ask a favor, we are sharing the same network uh, as the rest of you. So when we get to that portion, if you can uh, try not to use the Wi-Fi for that portion, that would be great. All right. So quick uh, introduction. Why, is, why does Docker exist? Why do we care about Docker? Um, why do we care about containers? And uh, the reason is something I like to call the matrix from hell. So. Uh, you all may remember back in the good old days or the bad old days, depending on how you think about it, when developers had one stack to develop on, they developed uh, applications on sort of a six-month or yearly cycle, and the applications were deployed on a single monolithic server. And of course, everything in that statement has now changed. Uh, deployment and application development is constant and iterative. Uh, we have a huge set of loosely coupled languages and frameworks. Uh, and components to choose from. And of course, whatever is developed somehow needs to work uh, on a laptop, on, uh, on a VM, on a physical uh, target, uh, on a cluster, an OpenStack cluster, public cloud, uh, the customer's environment, you name it. And that basically results in what uh, we at uh, Docker like to call the matrix from hell. Um, there's a sort of ever-increasing number of applications and frameworks and languages uh, and versions of applications that somehow need to be made to work across, uh, on the column space, lots of different targets. Um, so how can we actually make this work? Well, there are lots of solutions out there that try and automate part of this problem or make the problem less painful. We'd like to get rid of this matrix. And uh, in trying to think about how to do that, we actually took some inspiration from uh, the physical world, uh, the world of transport. So. Um, you know, 40 years ago, if you were going to ship good around the world, uh, everything was shipped in its own specialized container. Uh, you know, you had coffee beans and bags, you had uh, chemicals and drums, you had, uh, you know, parts packed into, into, into crates. And somehow, uh, whenever you went from a truck to a train to a crane to a rail, things got packed, unpacked. They interacted terribly. If you stored your, if you shipped your coffee beans, you had to worry that they'd be next to spices and would somehow get... Uh, corrupted, or if you were shipping bananas, you had to worry if somebody else was shipping anvils next to you and they would get smashed. Um, and then somebody came, this is also a matrix from hell, and then somebody came up with this bright idea of a shipping container. Now, you know, steel crates had been around for a long time, but the great idea behind the shipping container was that they're the same size, they have holes and hooks in all the same places, they have labels in the same places, and so basically you have a standard container that uh, anything can be packed into and that will then work anywhere. And as you all know, uh, once you are a manufacturer, you put stuff in your container, you seal it, uh, you're done, and that same container goes from ship to train to truck to rail uh, without having to be opened or modified. 
and it's revolutionized uh, world commerce and a bunch of other great things. Look at the uh, containers as you uh, leave the hall today and you go around Hong Kong. Um, so what Docker is, is it's trying to be a shipping container system for code. Um, a way for uh, developers to take any, uh, any application, its dependencies, and package it into a standard lightweight container which can then run uh, virtually anywhere. Uh, and as far as any development, uh, deployment target, it looks the same. And as far as the developer is concerned, any place it's going to be deployed to looks the same as well. Um, Docker eliminates the matrix from hell rather than trying to automate it away because in, in essence, if you are somebody who is building rows, you worry about getting things into a lightweight container. And if you're somebody who's running columns, you worry about running containers and you don't worry about what the applications or the languages are inside. Um, for developers, that means they can build once and, and finally run anywhere. I know we've been promised this for 20 years, uh, but at this point, um, a Docker container uh, can you know, encapsulate anything and will run on uh, any uh, x86 server running a modern Linux kernel. So that we don't care whether it's Ubuntu or Red Hat, we don't care, care whether it's physical or virtual, we don't care whether it's in the cloud or not. And in fact, as you'll see in the um, demo today, without modification or any noticeable downtime, we can move back and forth between different environments. And for DevOps, it's sort of the, the converse. Um, you can configure once and then run anything. Rather than worrying about your carefully configured system breaking when uh, developers get a new crazy idea, uh, you can configure once to run uh, containers. And since all containers respond to the same commands, they can be very easily automated. And you know, the reason that we think this works and uh, why we're excited is that you separate the concerns. So rather than forcing developers to think like ops folks or vice versa, developers in essence worry about getting things into containers um, and the ops guys worry about the outside of the container, logging, remote access, monitoring, network uh, config, et cetera. Uh, if you want a uh, more technical uh, explanation, we can talk to you afterwards, but um, I think uh, sort of the easiest way to think about this uh, sort of at a, at a high level is it's a, uh, it's a lightweight VM. And uh, if you're not familiar with sort of the difference between a container and a VM, uh, in the VM world, of course, uh, you start with an application and you take the application, its binaries, its libraries, uh, and a guest OS. You put that into a heavyweight, uh, heavyweight uh, form of isolation, run it on top of a hypervisor, run it on top of a host OS. And that is fantastic for many, many use cases. Uh, containers take a different approach. Uh, you take the application uh, and run it uh, um, in an isolated way as a process uh, on the host OS. So there's no guest OS. Uh, you can share binaries and libraries, and as a result, it's much smaller, it's much uh, lighter weight, there's no overhead, and um, of course, if you're starting and stopping an application, you're not having to start and stop an operating system, and it's, uh, if you're trying to sort of iteratively create and modify applications and the runtime environment, you don't have to create a new VM every time you do that. Uh, in essence, you can sort of think of this as taking uh, the way that you think about applications on your Android phone and making it available uh, for server software. Um, Docker takes that great idea, takes it a bit, a little bit further. Um, if you're familiar with, with Git uh, or, uh, or, uh, or copy on write, uh, in essence, uh, the original application is smaller. Uh, than a traditional VM, and the copy uh, you make of that is even smaller. And then as you modify things, uh, for the most part, you can deal with just the diffs. Um, basics of the Docker system. Uh, uh, Docker uh, uh, you know, runs uh, on uh, host OS. Um, let's say you're a developer. You can iteratively create your uh, containerized application. Uh, and push that to uh, an image registry. We have both a public and a private version of that. Um, uh, Docker, file, Docker containers can also be created automatically from source using something called a Docker file, and we'll demo that. Um, but essentially, once you have created uh, a container and pushed it to the registry, uh, any Docker host can pull that uh, image uh, and run it anywhere. Um, and that becomes very powerful for cross-cloud deployment. Um, and not only can any, uh, any uh, Docker host pull an image uh, as long as it has access to the registry, but updating running hosts, running uh, containers is also very easy because you're just pushing the differences. So as you'll see when uh, Nick does his demo, things can go very, very fast uh, when you're in a, in a Docker environment. 
So again, to repeat, once you have a, a Docker registry, essentially any Docker image hosted on any Docker registry can run on any Docker host uh, in seconds, actually uh, in, in milliseconds. All right, so I'm gonna just uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Docker community. Um, obviously, containers are not a new idea. We're building on top of some great work that has been done over the past 10 years uh, with folks in the, in the, uh, in the kernel community, uh, building LXC and uh, chroot and cgroups. Um, but what we've tried to bring to, uh, to the world is the ability for containers to be standardized and to have a community around that. And we're uh, very excited about the Docker community. As I mentioned, we now have over 200 contributors uh, working on Docker, the project. There are only uh, 14 of them work for our company, uh, so you can do the math. And they're actually responsible for half of all commits. Um, we, at this point, have over 20,000 that we know of trained uh, developers in Docker. Uh, they have, in turn, containerized thousands of applications, which are all available at the Docker uh, registry. Uh, there's a lot of great support and training resources available uh, on our site and elsewhere. Uh, if you're interested in a meetup, there are now meetups uh, somewhere in the world every day. Um, I think the, the latest one we heard about uh, is in Nairobi, uh, if you happen to be there. But if not, we've got London, Paris, Hamburg, uh, Lisbon, and of course Hong Kong covered. Um, also very excited to have a, uh, a lot of integrations with uh, Docker. Uh, all the common tools, Chef, Puppet, Saul, Ansible. Um, all done, by the way, by the community, not by, not by us. Um, uh, of course, we're here to talk about OpenStack. Uh, we've got a bunch of great integrations to talk to you about that. Um, also, a huge uh, set of third-party tools built on top of Docker. There are, I think at last count, uh, 15 companies that have started to build businesses on top of Docker, which we're really excited about. So, uh, standalone PaaSes, uh, you name it. Um, and also a bunch of great use cases. So even though we say Docker is not ready for production purposes, we sort of hear every day from people like uh, eBay and Rackspace Mailgun uh, and Yandex and Baidu and others who are saying they're cheerfully ignoring our warning. So, um, uh, and their use cases are available on the website. So, uh, quick introduction to Docker and OpenStack. Uh, Docker, uh, uh, has been accepted into uh, Havana. Uh, we have uh, a driver for Nova, so you can essentially treat Docker as another form of a VM. We have a lot of other interesting uh, use cases. Uh, if you come to the Dell booth, you can see Docker integrated with Crowbar for deploying uh, OpenStack. Uh, Cross-cloud application deployment you'll see here, and uh, a design session on Friday uh, around integration with Heat. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn things over to Rackspace. Rackspace, of course, is important to us, uh, not only in terms of how they use Docker, but of course as a major uh, OpenStack contributor and uh, a big contributor to this demo as well. So this is Jason Smith. I got one, I think. Go live? Cool. Cool, thanks, Ben. Okay, so at Rackspace, like he said, we are actually using Docker in production, even though we've been warned not to. Um, one of the main ways that we use it is actually with Mailgun, right? So Mailgun is a programmatic service that allows access to email through APIs. And because we're using that, we've got a lot of different applications and we run into a few different problems. So one of the main problems is there's complex environments, right? You've got your development, your staging, your production environments, and you need to make sure that each of these have the same uh, application and the same dependencies on them. So what we wanted to do is get the same image on each of these environments and luckily we we're able to do so with Docker. Uh, one of the other problems that we ran into with virtual machines was that we weren't able to take advantage of all of the processing power available, right? And so through Docker we're able to use the bare metal and use the actual processing power on those servers. We get all three exact same images on the three different environments. There's absolutely no VM overhead, and we're able to manage those pretty fairly easily. One of the other problems we ran into, though, was that as you're using Docker, if you only have a few, right, uh, creating containers, restarting them, uh, bringing, shutting down containers, and then starting them back up, really isn't a big deal, but when you run into, you're running thousands of different containers, that becomes a problem. 
And so at first we started out by using bash scripts and other things like that, which were dirty hacks. Um, we actually decided to go out and take some inspiration from Fabric, and we went out and wrote Shipper, which is actually an open source project that you guys can go check out. It's actually on GitHub, and you can please go ahead and contribute to that because I'm sure we have not thought of all the amazing things that you can add to that project. All right, so Project Solum, right? Everybody's heard about this. Um, it seems to be widely talked about at the summit. So you can see with Docker is it's actually the container for those compute VMs. If you are interested in Solum, there are plenty of sessions available, and then also there's a lot of talk around unconferences and other things going on currently. All right, so with that, I'll get out of the way, and you can see the awesome demo that Nick has prepared. Hello. Um, wow, sorry. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, let me just switch over really quick. Um, so as Ben talked about, um, what I'm going to be demoing today is multi-cloud deployment using Rackspace um, cloud, cloud engine. Um, so first of what I'm going to do is build a blog application on my laptop and then I'm going to push it to the Rackspace cloud without any changes, uh, run it there, and then push it into uh, a Glance integration and provision a container via Horizon. Before I get into that, though, I'm going to just give a quick introduction to how Docker works. So imagine you go to the Rackspace website um, or to Linode or to DigitalOcean and choose the option to provision a Docker host. Uh, really what that does is sets up a, an instance for you which has a static binary of Docker installed. So here you are at the command line and you type in Docker. That's the first introduction that you can have. Um, this gives you a list of all of the commands and how to use them. So let's run a very simple command. We want to uh, echo hello world inside of the BusyBox container. Or sorry, image. Uh, not so interesting, right? Um, but how about we create a, instead, I want to be interactive and allocate a pseudo TTY in BusyBox. And, excuse me, um, and uh, execute a shell session. So now I'm inside of a container. I cannot access anything on my host machine. I'm, I'm inside of a BusyBox image. I can do radical things like remove etc password, and there's no problems. Um, and as you can see, I still have, if I ex exit out of there, I still have etc password on my host. So all of that was completely isolated. Um, question. So I just, inside of the BusyBox image, uh, deleted or removed etc password. If I cat etc password right now, uh, any thoughts on what's going to happen? It shows up. Um, and so why is that? So Docker always starts from a base image. BusyBox is the base image. And every single time you run, images are immutable. And so there's a read-write layer in AOFS, if you're familiar with that, that's mounted on top of the base. And so all of the changes in this session are persisted in the base. So I'm going to open just a, another terminal here that's on the left for you guys. And what I'm going to do is introduce a command. So this is the last, if you push in, put in dash L. Actually, let me show you really quick. If you pass, pass in dash help, dash dash help after a command, it will show you all of the options that you can pass in. So dash L shows the last container that was run. If I docker diff this image, then you can see that as a part of the read write layer that exists now, um, we created dev, a K message, and a TTY that we asked to be allocated. So what happens if I rm etc password again? 
then you'll see that if I run the diff again, that uh, etc password was deleted. Um, so how would you persist a change like this uh, if you actually wanted to create a broken VisiBox image uh, that didn't have etc password for whatever reason? So there's, there's two ways. Again, you can see the last container that we ran with uh, docker ps-l. So what I can do is take this, uh, this container and name it and commit that into a, yet another immutable image. Um, and so what that allows you to do and what that means is that uh, containers are instances of images with the read-write layer, and any container can become instantly an image if you commit it. Okay, so the other way to do that would be to create a Docker file. So if you have a Docker file, you would basically say from busybox run run rm etc password. You would save this, you would docker build broken busy box. Oops. In this directory, and what that will do is create an image with all of those steps without having to do it inside of the shell session. And if I had docker images grab busy box, then you'll see that my image actually is right here. Okay, oops. So, let's get into a actual demo of deploying the blog to uh, the cloud. So, I have my, my uh, git checkout master of the latest of my, my blog. It has a Docker file. It's very simple. There's a, a image that I'm inheriting from called pblog. I'm adding the contents of the current directory to slash website. This application is a Flask application, so by default it listens on uh, port 5000. And this is the default command I want to run when I'm launching this image. So if I docker build uh, and pass in a tag for this, so I want to call this um, blog OpenStack in this uh, in this directory. So it's built, and I can Docker run dash d, which sends it to the background. Here's my ID. I can Docker ps dash l, um, and you can see that here is the command uh, that was run. Here, the, the command that I showed, it's been up for two seconds. And port 5000 is actually mapped to the host on 49156. So I can do something like curl HTTP localhost 49156. And you can see that there's my application up and running. So now what if I want to make a change? So let me just make a quick change to the footer and say hello to everyone. So hello, OpenStack. All right, let me uh, build that again. Let me run it again. And let's see which port was allocated to it. So 49160, rerun our curl command. And you can see the same, the update is now there. If, for whatever reason, we wanted to roll back while well, the previous container is still running, uh, so I actually want the last three. Oops. And you can see that the previous one got untagged, but it's still there. Uh, so, and still running on the previous, on the previous port. So I can still, I can still curl that. And you can see that the OpenStack thing is not there. Um, another question for you. So, 
uh, how do you think, how long do you think it would take for an application to spin up maybe 20 times on the same host um, without modification? So since it's listening on port 5000, normally I'd have to go into my application, change the port dynamically, and then, uh, uh, or find some way to change the port dynamically. But in this way, I can actually run n number of instances of my blog, and you can see that uh, all of these are running. I could pick a random port and curl it, and that would be the update. So let's assume that I actually wanted to make this a persistent change and push this out to my production machine. So let's, let's tag that, my, my new OpenStack image, and provide a location for a, a registry that is accessible uh, by, by a machine on the internet. Uh, so I will call this, I will tag it as, I will prefix it with the URL of where this public registry is available, and then give it the same name. And then I can Docker push it What this does is, since uh, Docker files are built on layers, what it does is it uh, walks the tree of the, the, the latest all the way back to the base, uh, communicates with the registry and says, do you have this ID? And if it does, uh, then it doesn't push anything. So you can see that actually my, my update was just one meg, which is the size of the, the directory that I'm currently in. Um, and now I have my application completely ready to run. Uh, what I can do is X SSH to my Rackspace cloud. I can then Docker pull it. Oops, forgot my T. The uh, pull's really fast because there's not much that's changed. I can then run the same thing. I can do the same docker ps-l. I can see that it's running here on 49741, uh, and I can curl localhost 49741. And you can see that hello app OpenStack is there. I can show you in the browser as well, I guess. Uh, oops. Sorry, I forgot the port. Um, 49741. Four So this is the problem with the network. Uh, sometimes it takes a bit of time and goes in and out. Well, I'll go back to that in a moment. Okay, so now let's actually push this to Glance and provision it there. So I'm going to now SSH to my OpenStack cluster, assuming and hoping this works. I will then do the same thing And so that's gonna do uh, a pool. And then I'm going to actually uh, get the instance of where the registry that is uh, provisioned to use Glance as a backend store. So I'm going to Docker tag Sorry, I know that went off the screen a bit. Okay, and then I'm just going to do the same 
Docker push. And what that's gonna do is that we have a registry that's sitting there. It's configured to stream directly to Glance, and Glance has been provisioned uh, to allow Docker images to be stored there. And so this is going to do the same thing. It's uh, checking to see which layers it already has, not sending those, and only sending the diffs. So back to our browser. Uh, let's go to our OpenStack cluster. Let's go over here to projects and instances. We will launch an instance. We will call this blog. We will boot from an image. And you can see that my blog OpenStack is available here and I can launch it. Oh, great, there's an error. Okay, <laughs> normally that works, sorry. Um, what that would then allow you to do is uh, go into and switch to the OpenStack, or sorry, to the DevStack user. This, this cluster was provisioned using dev, uh, DevStack. Go to this DevStack directory uh, use the OpenRC and Nova List. It should show up here, uh, but it, there was an error for some reason. And if I look at Docker PS L, then you should see that the. Oops. Okay, so there's something that really went wrong. Um, I can definitely show this working uh, when when the uh, shortly after this. So. Uh, that's it for the demo. Are there any questions? Go ahead. So, if I use a VM and it has a assign a kernel a CPU or memory that is associated with a VM, right? yep. this cluster can do that? Yes, absolutely. So the question was, um, can you set CPU and memory li limits for a container? Yes. Um, if you do a docker run dash dash help, uh, what you can see is that you can pass in uh, a dash M to set a memory limit in bytes, and you can pass in a dash, uh, I forget the exact command. Uh, you can pass in, anyway, a command to set the CPU affinity. Go ahead. Is there any way to pass in a environment variable for things like ULimit into a container? So you can absolutely pass in, uh, so the question was, can you pass in environment variables into a container and then set uh, like things like U limit? Um, yes, absolutely. So you can set the U limit of, an, uh, of a PID from outside of the host, um, and passing in uh, an environment variable to a process is running dash E. So you docker run dash E uh, and your key value mapping to the, to the image. And the default environment variables will be inherited from the host, right? I'm sorry, what was the question? What about default env environment? It so, will be inherited from a host? Yes, it can be, if you would like. But let's just take a look. So these are the, the default environment variables that are passed in um, during container creation. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions I have is regarding, you know, if you have a Docker, right, and an application from within Docker do a syscall, can it make my bare metal unusable by other Dockers in that way? If it's like a lot of syscalls it's making to the system resources and then other Docker processes cannot access it, something like that, or is there any security layer there which will avoid that? So you can set limits on processes just like you can um, in, a, in a Linux like any, any Linux uh, process. So, um, and you can also set, like as we talked about, CPU and memory constraints. So I, I, I have a feeling that there are certain pathological cases that you can create that would allow you to um, affect other containers, absolutely. Um, but we should talk about that more because um, I want to hear sort of an exact use case. Right. So 
So right now, the backend's container provider. So the question is, can you use OpenBZ or any other container providers with Docker? Um, today, no. Uh, LXC is tightly coupled with Docker. In the future, yes, absolutely. Uh, the futures for Docker make uh, Docker container agnostic. So it will also be able to run as an example uh, on top of BSD jails or Solaris zones. That's definitely a goal of ours. So as a consumer of the Nova API, what's the advantage of using the Docker plugin versus another container plugin like LSC, LXC through, C through Libbird or something like that? Um, so a big, a, a big problem that we try to solve above LXC is the shipping of images around. Um, so LXC is fine to use if you have just a static one image um, without having to worry about uh, how to create and manage multiple. And so uh, if you already have, as an example, like a bunch of images in Glance and you just want to provision them in LXC, my guess is there's not much. Um, but if you don't and you want to develop a workflow that is constantly pushing to uh, Glance and therefore able to be booted through Nova, Docker provides a huge edge and convenience. So a whole bunch of downloads that, that we saw. So did it uh, download, like, do, did it push those many instances in the production server, or what was the download that we saw there? The, the downloads that you saw were uh, the Docker daemon checking to see if it had all of the layers that comprise of my blog image, um, and only downloading the delta, which was a one meg diff. All right. um, but uh, Spinning up multiple instances on the production is exactly the same and takes uh, exactly the same amount of time. There's no difference. Yeah, sorry, here. Um, we're using Docker containers in our OpenStack environment, and we found some issues related to security groups, actually. Okay. Uh, we're able to actually apply rules uh, to Docker containers uh, are you working on that, or supposed to be working on Havana? Uh, as far as I know, it should be working in Havana. Let's let's talk afterwards. Yeah, uh, we're using Neutron. That's the particular of the stuff. We're using security groups on Neutron. So. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Are there any other questions? Does Docker um, control the, the, the guest's access to kernel memory? I'm sorry, does Docker what? Control the, the, the container's access to kernel memory. So the, the memory usage in the kernel, the kernel pages? Yes, yes. And so today, um, all of that's, that's helped by AUFS. Um, unfortunately, that ability goes away temporarily in 0.7. Um, which will be released in a couple of weeks as we switch to Device Mapper. We get the benefit of being portable across many more um, uh, Linux environments, but the downside is that it's block level, so you don't have access necessarily to the kernel pages no, so and shared memory. Uh, yeah, I'm in the kernel memory, so I can't exhaust kernel memory from within a container. I'm sorry, what? I can't exhaust kernel memory from within a container. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I don't have the answer to that question. I, I'm sorry, I need to wrap up. So um, the key takeaways are that the container revolution is coming. Uh, our ecosystem matters. Uh, Cross-cloud deployment is here, and OpenStack and open source technologies are leading the way. Uh, if you want to lo learn more, uh, please go to docker.io. Uh, our GitHub is .cloud slash docker. Our IRC channel is incredibly active and amazing. Uh, there's a Google group, and please follow us on, on Twitter. Uh, if you'd like a Docker shirt, I've actually given the, all of mine out today. Um, I will have, each of us will have about 10 or 15 tomorrow. Um, so please come by and say hi, and we'll be happy to, to give you them. Uh, we do have stickers, though. So thank you very much.